Hello and welcome to Extreme Metal Television. I'm your host, Simon. In this episode, we have a chat with Fuck the Facts, the Black Dahlia Murderer, and the new Jacobin Club. But first, let's kick it off with a band profile. West of Hell was formed in 2002 in Auckland, New Zealand, and then relocated to Vancouver, British Columbia. The band recently released their first album, Spiral Empire. It's uh, pretty much, I think, the kind of metal that uh, I grew up with and the guys in the band grew up with. You know, I don't want to reference everything that I listen to, but I, it's essentially traditional metal that doesn't sound old. Yeah. You know? Well, that's what I found from what I'd heard from it so far. It does have that traditional metal sound, but yeah. it does have a modern edge to it as well. Yeah. Uh, is that important when you're recording it? I mean, I don't think those, that I don't think those things don't even come to mind. You yeah. just you just do what you do, yeah. right? And uh, the, those guys, that band started in Auckland, New Zealand, with uh, a couple guitar players and a drummer, and you know they had half that album written. And what I do vocally is just sort of an answer to to, to what they've already laid down. How did you develop your vocal style, really? I guess. It's well, I'm all over the I'm all over the map. No, I'm I mean. all over the map vocally, right? Yeah. Um, it was just more of what felt right for that music. I mean, uh, the Zimmer's Hole project. It's it's very schizophrenic and it has a very dynamic sort of. Uh, treatment but west of hell is i'm trying to work within parameters that fit the music you know what i mean and if i'm going to do more than one project they can't be copycats the album artwork is uh, quite striking uh, uh, who was the artist and what was the concept behind that um his name's ivan and he was an earlier guitar player, yeah. um, but uh, unfortunately he had to go back to New Zealand, but he's also a, a very talented uh, artist. He, he painted the album, I think, the album cover, I think it was something like 4x4, four four, oil painting. Really? Yeah. So what's the idea behind it? It's a uh, pretty interesting cover. <laughs> the title track, Spiral Empire, is basically how North America is going into the toilet financially socially, you know, culturally, it's, and the, the album cover reflects that, basically. Okay, uh, now, uh, Spiral Empire was produced by uh, Rob Shalcross. Uh, what was that recording process like? Oh, um, it, uh, Rob's very, very thorough, so he wasn't going to let us get away with anything but our best performance, so there was a lot of uh, pushing. And, failing and then approaching it again to get it right yeah, yeah. he's uh, a good producer yeah uh, you've worked with him in the past yeah he's, he's, he's worked on a lot of good stuff so happy to work with Rob I had lunch with him and he had a rubber chicken that exploded on my leg that's Rob <laughs> 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 you, we, it's, it's really important in the studio working with Rob that everyone has to wear a superhero cape <laughs> mandatory or else he's not going to record you that's the way it fucking goes. We caught up with Ryan Knight from the Black Dahlia Murder to discuss the band's latest album, Rituals, which has each different song based on a separate ritual. We asked Ryan if he liked working within a theme. I do, because I think it, uh, well, I guess it's mo really more, I guess, from Trevor's standpoint, but, because, uh, you know, he's writing all the lyrics yeah. and stuff, but, uh, I mean, I, I like I having sort of a uh, theme or a concept, you know, it just seems to make the record um, a little more, feel like a whole, you know, yeah. where you have this one big thing that you're working with, you know. So what comes first then, like, when you're deciding to write within a theme? Do, does the music come first and then the lyrics, or does is there an idea about what the album's going to be about and then you write the music towards in that direction? Uh, usually, Trevor will kind of have an idea of, you know, maybe like the title of the album, 
uh, and then and then we'll write the music, and then he'll sort of start ba- you know doing the lyrics. Yeah. So we do the music first, yeah. and uh, and if he's already thought of a title, then he might start basing stuff off of that, sort of like he did on this record. <laughs> I was wondering where that whole idea of doing an album based on rituals came from. Um, let's see. I'm not I'm really not. This is more of a Trevor yeah, question, but uh, <laughs> it, I mean, it's just kind of like we just kind of looked into it as you know. There's just so many things that you do on a day-to-day basis, like that are sort of ritualistic, you know. Like being in a band in itself. I mean, you know, it's just like interacting with your audience, you know. Anything, you know, if you drink, that could be like a ritual. If you smoke weed, you know, whatever, whatever you might do, you know, any anything, you know. So. Since the Black Dolly Murder released Rituals last year via Metal Blade Records, the band has been pretty much constantly on tour and have covered a lot of the globe. We asked Ryan what keeps him motivated when he's on the road. Well, you know, playing shows is fun. Uh, you know, just getting to interact with the crowd, and uh, I mean, it's just what we love to do. You know, I mean, that's I guess that's the main motivation. And um, I mean, you know, going places, you know, going to cool places, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys have been pretty much around the world on this. Oh yeah, for this we, album. Yeah, we um, let's see, we actually just yeah, we did South America in December. And we did the UK and some of Europe in January. Then we did Australia and some Asia stuff in February and March, and then we just did the States, and now we're in, here in Canada. Yeah. So, so was that like you, you hit up Malaysia? Uh, where, where did you guys go? Exactly? We went. Let's see. We went to Thailand, um, the Philippines, Indonesia, Japan. That was all the Asia stuff. Yeah, that must have been quite an experience. Oh yeah, yeah. It was cool. Was that the first time the band had done those those venues? It was the it was the the band's been to Japan a few times, okay, but uh, yeah. it was the second time we've been to Indonesia, and it was the first time that we've been to the Philippi- to the Philippines and uh, Thailand. <laughs> Uh, on Ritual, you once again worked with uh, Mark Lewis and uh, Jason Sukov. Do uh, uh, you think it's important to the band's sound to keep uh, working with the same people? Um, yeah, I mean, Mark and Jason just, uh, you know, we've known those guys for a while and they just really know how to sort of capture the sound that we're looking for. And they're really knowledgeable about, um, you know, like death metal and stuff like that. And uh, they're just, you know, knowledgeable dudes. They, they know the genre well, they know what sound we're looking for. Um, you know, they're actually, both of them are actually both guitar players too, so, you know, they have that department going on, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think they have definitely brought something, you know, to our sound as far as, you know, the, the production standpoint of it, so. It sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're really happy with, uh, all the work we've done with them. Anything those guys touch when it comes up. Oh, uh, yeah. Sounding sounds pretty. <laughs> what was the studio experience like for this album? Like, uh, as opposed to you know, prior ones, I guess. Um, the studio experience, well, this was my second album with the band, but the, the, the actual studio experience was it was pretty much similar to the way that we did Def, uh, Deflorate. Uh, Mark Lewis flew up to Detroit. Uh, we tracked all the drums and guitars up there, and the vocals were done in, um, down in Florida with Jason. So other than that, that was... Uh, that was pretty much the same. The the thing that was a little different on this album was actually the like the writing, because uh, on Deflorate, I you know Brian pretty much wrote almost all that album. I came in later and just did the solos, but uh, on this on this album Ritual, it was kind of like Brian wrote half the songs and I wrote half the songs. So we we just split the songwriting more. So that was really what was I guess mainly different for this album. <laughs> Quebec Grinders Fuck the Facts rolled through town recently and we had a chance to sit down and speak to vocalist Mel Mangion about how the band first started up and about their impressive discography. Um, it started as a recording project, like a sort of project of our guitar player, Topan, and uh, he made it into like a full band to play live shows in 2001. And since then the band like uh, been busy playing shows and recording. And uh, from my end, I joined in 
2002, and we've been having the same lineup for the past four years. You know, for all the, that this discography is to really like, a lot of splits came from like between like, you know, 97 and 2004, we would release songs on compilation here and there, or, you know, noise split and things like that. And when you look at it, it looks crazy, but it's not, you know, it's not as crazy as like the, it looks like it is, um, you know, if you look at the past five years, we have like two albums and a split and an EP. Like we've, not we relax, but we're still kind of workaholics. So a day off doesn't really exist. Like the concept of being bored is not something that, uh, I, sometimes I wish I would be bored sometimes. Fuck the Facts released their newest album, Die Miserable, in 2011. We asked Melo how the fans were reacting to the new album. It's been going well. I mean, you know, you're never in people's houses when they put the album on or if they decide to not listen to it. Like, you know, like we had some good reviews and like we're happy with it and shows have been going well, yeah. Cool. You do all the artwork for the band, right? Yeah. And uh, when did that first start up, and how did that come about? I always liked uh, like drawing, painting, or whatever. So as soon as I joined the band, I started right away doing like t-shirt designs. Or uh, for me, I found it like a, an awesome occasion to join, like being in a band and being able to yeah. do visual stuff. So it just happened kind of naturally. And nowadays, like I don't have as much time uh, as I wish I would. So. I don't do the t-shirt on the t-shirt design anymore, which is good in a way because we got some awesome uh, people to do uh, good stuff. So, but I I still do all the albums. It feels like for the album it's more us if it's like not from A to Z, but there's more of our signature. Then I don't know. This is Morgan O'Marduk, you are watching Extreme Metal Television. In this episode of Vintage Metal, we're going to be taking a look at the tragically underrated second album from Tokyo Blade, Night of the Blade. Now, this album saw the band introducing a brand new lead vocalist, Vic Wright. The vocals on the album had been recorded by the band's original vocalist, Alan Marsh, but Wright came in to lay down a new vocal track, and interestingly enough, Marsh's background vocals were left on the album. Now, Vic Wright recorded two albums with Tokyo Blade, and then went on to form another tragically underrated band called Johnny Crash, but that deserves its own segment. Tokyo Blade's Night of the Blade is just one kick-ass new wave of British heavy metal album. Might be a little hard to find, but it's worth seeking out. You won't be disappointed. The new Jacobin Club have been bringing their brand of shock rock to Western Canada since the mid-90s. Accompanied with the Angry Teeth Freak Show, the band puts on one hell of a live performance. We caught up with them when they were recently in town to ask about their brand new EP. Uh, it's four songs. It was actually something we recorded a year ago, but weren't sure we were going to release it. We went into the studio as kind of a 15th anniversary celebration and uh, recorded three really old songs. And we added a live song and thought we'll release this as an actual, you know, 15th anniversary EP sort of thing, yeah. rather than just keep them as something we'd throw in as a bonus track later on something. We didn't know what we were going to do with it at the time, but we put it out and we're actually really happy. So why do you think now is the time to, to re-record those songs? Well, because the band has changed so much. Uh, it's expanded and contracted over the last 15 years that when we started out, we were playing a certain kind of music and, and with the immense amount of people that have come and gone in this group over the years, a lot of people would look at us and say, well, it's not really the same band anymore. And, and we'd kind of, kind of be taken aback by that and say, no, it is. Look, we're still playing some of the same material. We deliver it a little differently now and we like the way we do it now. So we thought we'd like commit that to a recording rather than just 
you can come and see us live and we're still playing some tunes we were in the 90s, but they sound a lot different yeah. with the seven people we got now, so. Why did you decide to release it as a pay what you want down uh, that's kind of the way the industry is going right now, and to to actually get back behind to get behind something and fund a physical release like that nowadays, uh, we're not really behind that anymore unless it's something truly worth taking home. And this is a four-song EP. There is a physical version of it, but it is available as a digital download. Pay what you want, and you know if you don't want to pay anything, that's fine. We want you to have it. So, yeah. so you think that's a good way to go then? I think that's the way it is now. Yeah. I think I think music is free. I really do. Um, if you buy the CD, uh, you're not just buying the CD. You're buying the artwork and the packaging and everything. And we've always made sure to have some... We have some very talented artists, graphic designers that work with us. And uh, so we really want to make things... If you're going to buy a physical copy of something, it'll be something worth taking home and not just for the music. Because if you want the music, you go online, you can get it. It's not hard to find. The new Jacobin Club released this treason last year and it had quite an elaborate storyline. Now I hear the band's upcoming new album described as an apocalyptic Victorian conspiracy. We asked the band to fill us in on that one. So we take a lot of inspiration from, uh, from various interesting things that people did in the past. And one of those is uh, during Victorian times in Victorian London they'd have, I believe, hellfire parties where they would come and uh, bring unsuspecting um, well-to-do dilettante type people and basically they would go there for a debauch party all in the name of occult science and such but our ideas um, coming up in Victorian uh, sort of with the Victorian flair is an unsuspecting person comes and gets taken into an actual occult initiation and yeah. doesn't know what's going but on we're also, so we're, that's 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 the freak show part of it we're, yeah we're also kind of warping yeah. it around the whole kind of political background yes. of the band like as uh, we are kind of a, an occult political organization and uh, our, our little club is not just, we're sitting back and watching the end of the world. We're, we're sitting back and watching it happen. And we're also behind the scenes, pulling yeah. strings, helping it happen. Yeah. And, this is, and, and this has been an ongoing theme with the, with the band since day one. So that's, what, that's kind of what the new Jackman Club is. We are watching society absolutely just you know, ruin itself, <laughs> and we're loving it and laughing at it all the way. Well, that's it for another episode of Extreme Metal Television. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I'd also like to thank my co-hosts King and Dr. Gore. If you'd like to contact us, please feel free to send us an email at extrememetaltv at gmail.com. Check out our Facebook page, and before I let you go, here's a terrible tale from the road from Annex Theory. So this morning we were driving through Saskatchewan and Somewhere. right on the top of the hill there's a deer carcass, but Trevor doesn't notice until after he hits it. <laughs> now, so it's an already dead deer. We, we, <laughs> just worse than the band alive cleared deer. it, but we heard a, like a scrape and wakes these guys up. And I'm like, that doesn't sound too bad, does it? <laughs> so we pull we over something. and we check, and there's just like this splatter pattern on the back trailer, there's, like, and there's like this the chunk of like on the deer top right here. Like, like, there's like, like venison yeah. all coiled like up in the like chain, this is the thing and there's little the pieces <laughs> of it on the back of the van. You can like, tell like, He's just dipping down from the trailer when it hit the thing and just like dug in and just like yes, just like splattered. I have a poutine waiting in there.